amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to Grace Epistolic Church. Amen. So glad to have you here today. If you'd all stand to your feet, we'll get started this evening. Amen. Aren't you glad for a place to come on a Wednesday night Bible study? Amen. God is so good to us. We love Him very much. Always count an opportunity to be in the house of the Lord today. <clears throat> Again, we want to welcome you here. And we know we hope the Lord will bless you tonight before you leave here uh, this evening. We're going to open up tonight with some prayer requests. Uh, if you like to make those known at this time, we'll pray for those things. We know that God can hear hear us when we pray, knows about them before we even ask them. So I know, Brother Clee, you have a prayer request today? Okay. Friends of the Clees, they live up in Saginaw. Just found out that their daughter has two holes in her heart. That's a, causing a, a problem. So we know the Lord can can put those, mend those hearts and heal that body. So what, what's what's her name? Do you know what her name is? Sadie? Okay, we're going to be praying for Sadie. Lord, would we'll touch her heart in Jesus' name. Yes, Sister uh, Sabra. Let's remember Hans Kuhner. He's been here several times, loves the church, and we're going to pray the Lord would touch him, uh, heal him of that pneumonia. Sister Rudd. Amen. Let's remember that, Aunt Lori. Okay, let's remember Sabrina. She's got COVID tonight, so let's pray the Lord touch her. Sister Farmer. Okay. So there's still people that are getting COVID. I thought everyone had it by now. All right. And so also Sister Kylie has it as well. Let's remember her. She's coming out of it. And yes, Jack. Bishop Parent. Let's continue to remember him. In his body, as he's been going through just a struggle for a long time now, ask the Lord to touch his body. Lots to pray for, and then the Lord knows it, and uh, that's what we call prayer meetings. It's time for us to pray and ask God to touch those situations, and we know he hears them tonight, and he hears them before we even bring them before him. So let's pray. Let's invite his presence into this house at this time, calling on these requests as we do it at this time. Lord, we're so thankful today, Lord, for your goodness and mercy to us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us one more time to be gathered in this place. Lord, you see all these requests have been laid at your feet. God, you knew about them before we even brought them. Lord, touch Sadie today, Lord, those holes in her heart. God, you know you can heal those things. There's nothing too great for you, Lord. Touch Bishop Parent, God. Touch Hans today. Touch him of his pneumonia, Lord, God. Touch all those requests that have been laid at their feet, God. Those that are sick, those that are indifferent in their spirit, God. Lord, touch Sabrina, Lord. All those who are suffering with COVID, I pray that, God, you bring a uh, spirit of healing into this place, God. We, we love you and believe you for all things. We welcome you into this place. Have your way. Let our praise and our worship be acceptable in your sight. Bless the word of God as it goes forth tonight. We love you today. We praise you. Expect something great from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wonder if we can put our hands together one more time. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together as we sing. Let's not just be a spectator. Let's be a participator in the worship of God. Now. Amen. Amen.
Put those hands together and love the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, for any time he's ever been good to you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I praise you. I worship you. I exalt you, Lord, today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. My, my, sick, my circumstance doesn't argue against the fact that God is good and he does all things well. Just because I doesn't feel good doesn't mean that God is not doing things well in my life. Amen. I appreciate my faith to trust in Him no matter what I'm facing and through all my circumstances and situations. Amen. Thank you, praise team. Amen. Thank you, Grace Epistolic Church. You can find your way back to your seats. <clears throat> We're going to receive our offering tonight. Do have a couple of announcements while you're, re- while you're preparing your offering today. That There's brotherhood and sisterhood this Friday night. Uh, details are on the Life Group app. So if you go to your Life Group app, you'll find out what's happening. Uh, if you have any questions, please see anyone in the youth board. Uh, I think Brother Ramsey or Brother James, I thought Brother James was coming in here. Brother James Chico might be able to answer some questions uh, about what's happening this Friday. Also, Kids Choir is starting back up next uh, next on Wednesday, 421. So we are, our Kids Choir starting back up. Anybody excited about that? Amen. Kids Choir starting back up. I will tell you a, a story. Uh, it won't be very long, so my parents are standing. Appreciate them standing. Uh, when I was in kids' choir, see, I didn't get a choice whether or not I was going to sing in kids' choir. If I was, if, if the age was till 12 years old in kids' choir, I sang until I was 12 years old. Now, I was this tall. Look at this tall, 12. And everyone else is down here. I said, Dad, I don't, I don't want to sing in kids' choir because I'm way too tall. I said, son, you're going to be an example. You're going to sing until you're 12 years old. And I sang until I was 12 years old. Bless the Lord. Look where I am today. Praise God. <laughs> they had to make me pastor because they couldn't sing very well in the kids' choir. So they had to give, give me something to do, so they just let me. Amen. Sister Shelley Dowden also needs pictures um, of mom and their kids no later than May 5th. These pictures can be given to her electronically or photo paper. Any questions, please see Sister Shelley Dowden. I, I assume that's for Mother's Day. So get, make sure you get some pictures of you and your kids. Also, spring conference. Everyone say spring conference. April 23rd and 24th at Brother Nathan Bryan's church. He's the host pastor. His church is in Wilmington, uh, Wilmington, Michigan, which is in the Lansing area. 
see Sister Lana if you want more details, but I, I want to see a great showing from our church. There will be no youth service that night, so come on out to our spring conference and uh, be a blessing to Brother Brian. Their church is brand new into our organization, so we want to come and show great, great support there. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to receive our offering. I mean, to all of our guests who are here, we're so glad that you're here. Please make yourself feel at home, but don't feel obligated to give in this offering. But we know this is the way for us to give back in our worship of our giving to the Lord. Let's pray for our offering at this time. Lord, we're so thankful today, Lord, for your spirit that's already in this house, for what you're doing even in this place. God, I pray that our expectation would be high, that we expect that you can do anything on a Wednesday night, Lord. God, I've asked you to bless this offering. Let it be multiplied for your purpose and your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone get one of their handouts. Everyone get one of their handouts. Yeah, let's give it up for Brother John Chacone, piano player, extraordinaire. <laughs> Amen. Everyone get one of their handouts. I'm going to be reading quickly in the Word of God to 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse number 13. I made 60 of these, so hopefully I uh, made enough for everyone. There's a good crowd here tonight. Hopefully everyone got one. If, uh, if you're a couple, if you're a husband and wife, Give it to the person with the best handwriting so you guys can read it later and study from it throughout the week. These, you can use these if you're, looking for, if you're looking for personal study time, maybe things you want to look at and, and you're not, not really sure where to read in the Word of God. Start with these. Go back over these again and look at the Scriptures, the thought process, and that can help you in your study time. Uh, if you didn't get one, please raise your hand so this handsome young gentleman can get you a, a handout for tonight's lesson. I was talking about you, son. That's right. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Well, that, that ought to make us check our words before we speak, wouldn't it? Amen. The things you want to say, you don't say them because you want to be like Jesus. And when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When they cut him down, even on the cross, he did not say a, a slanderous word against those people. But be holy in all manner of conversation, I would say in lifestyle and conduct and all those things. Finally, verse 16, because it is written... Why am I holy? Because it's written. Why do I live the way I do? Because it is written. And what is written is never going to change. I don't care if the fashion of this world changes. I don't care if trends come and go. It is written and will forever be written. That we are holy because I am holy is what the Word of God says. Be holy for I am holy. Holy. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight on the subject. It's old fashioned, folks. Be ye holy. Is it? Can we hear some holiness stuff across the pulpit still in 2021? Is it okay to talk about holy? Is that a byword or is that an okay thing to talk about? Are we a holiness church? 
Do we believe in being holy? Do we still believe in being like Jesus? Do we still believe in separation from the world and the things that are in the world? Do we believe that? Do we believe that God still wants a holiness church? Well, most of you are convinced, and we'll hopefully convince the rest of you by the time we're done tonight, all right? Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord Jesus. I just finished a book that I had been trying to finish for a long time. But you know how it is. You got like seven or eight books going, and you just got to finish one, right? You just got to finish it. So I just finished the book entitled A Long and Winding Road by Ken Raggio. He is an apostolic oneness preacher that came out of the Church of God organization when the Lord showed him the revelation of the oneness of Jesus and the necessity of Jesus' name baptism in water baptism. He had already received the Holy Ghost while he was in the Church of God movement and he held a very modest standard of outward appearance for both he and his wife while they were in the church. They were actually holiness people in the church of God. But in his book, The Long and Winding Road, he talks about the change that he saw taking place in the church of God movement and other holiness churches at that time in the mid-70s. And how the change of the mid-70s have changed the face of the Christian church today as we know it. He talks about all these different movements and fads that become that came into the churches in the 70s. Now, I don't have the book in front of me, so please if you I know some of you read it, you can help me out with it, but but one fad that came into the church in the mid 70s or in the Church of God church and other surrounding churches in the south predominantly was this Jesus love movement. It was all about the love of Jesus, this movement that we want to preach the love. Uh, and who doesn't want to preach the love of Jesus? Who doesn't want to say that Jesus loves? Eh, we know that. But it was this amazing fad that came through the church that, that it was all about uh, the love of Jesus. And through this fad of the churches, he heard of churches that were growing to seven to 800 people almost overnight. I mean, churches that were established, and by a couple weekends, they had filled the auditoriums in, in a couple weekends. And he's struggling as a minister, a pastor, trying to preach doctrine and separation from the world. And he's struggling to grow his church, and he's seeing all these churches, mega churches down south. And... Um, but one thing that he also talks about is that when this Jesus love movement took over, the churches also, in the process, let down convictions of separation and righteousness, personal living, that they once held. So here they're welcoming the Jesus movement, but they're letting down the convictions that at one time brought them to where they are. Are we with me here? All right, So they began to allow things into the church that at one time they used to preach against. Things that were before not acceptable have somehow become acceptable in the church of God. Brother Raggio said that he had worked really hard to grow the church that he was pastoring of about 100 people. To try to get it to grow to 100 people took him between 5 and 10 years. He's struggling, he's praying, he's fasting, he's doing everything he can, okay? In 5 and to 10 years, he grew it to 100 people. He was invited by a friend that he knew to come see his thriving church of about 800 people. He was amazed when he went down to his friend's church at what he saw. He could not believe the crowd that gathered at that church on that Sunday night. When he finally got a chance to be with his friend by himself in his office, he asked his pastoring friend that he knew for many years, what did he possibly do to grow his church at such an unbelievable rate? His friend said, Ken, you have to stop preaching hellfire and brimstone. You've got to quit preaching against sin. 
people want to hear about the love of Jesus. And in this saying, and in this belief, many people have lost an understanding of what God is truly looking for in His church. Yes, He loves us. Let's get over that. We know the cross says He loves us. But He also expects something of us. Do not take all the love of Jesus without knowing that he also expects something of us. That's where we lose it. He loves us so much, but we can do whatever we want, and he's always going to love us. That's not true. He will forever love us. But that does not mean that he, 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 he is happy or goes along with what we do just because he loves us. <clears throat> Romans 6 tells us that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That, that doesn't, and so, so Paul says, you guys are getting this wrong. You guys are loving the, 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 the grace of God, and we all love the grace of God. We need the grace of God. But what was happening is because they were no longer under the Old Testament law like they were used to, they now have this newfound grace. And because of this newfound grace, they're now thinking, I can do whatever I want, and I can still get to go to heaven. But Paul says, no, no, you, you're missing it. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid, how can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, what grace is, grace, the grace that abounded your sin is when you were a drunkard and a liar and a thief and an adulterer and, and you had all these wrong problems and you couldn't see straight and you were alienated from God and you were a boozer and a loser and a broken down mess. As bad as you were, the grace of God extended itself way beyond your worst sin and found you in the pit where you were at and pulled you up and turned you into something beautiful. That's what the grace of God is. The grace of God is not to go back and return to that mess and, and return to that filth and just expect God's going to love you. No, God has expectations of you. <laughs> expectations. <clears throat> His love for us does not turn a blind eye to any sin that's in us. That's where people miss it. I can sin because we're all sinners. And his love is so great that it's almost like he doesn't notice my sin problem. His love does not negate our present sin as though it's okay to continue and still be right with him. Now, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about someone that falls in sin and gets back up and you repent of it and get right. I'm talking about someone that lives in it and says, it's okay. I, I didn't do it before, but now I found this new revelation of, of grace. So before I wouldn't do it, but now I can do it. I'm okay with it. I used to preach against it, but now it's okay because I've lost convictions. And someone living in that lifestyle, God is not pleased with that lifestyle. Now, if you make a mistake and you fall to sin and you want to get right with God, you get down on your face, on your knees, say, God, I'm sorry, I want to get right with you. And God will forgive you. That's a big difference of being sorry for what you've done and living in sin because you think God's grace is so powerful and mighty. <clears throat> in fact, you want to know it, our sin stops our fellowship with God. I can cry and make a show. I can lift my hands and do a little jig. But that does not bring down the presence of God. That makes me feel okay in my flesh. Oh man, I really danced till I got I was so tired, man. My, my calves are sore. I'm so, I'm so overworked in my praise. And God said, I didn't even see it. Because the sin in your life is louder than the worship you display on a Sunday. Acts 17.30, am I, am I messing you guys up on your booklets? Are you guys following me? Okay, his sin for us does not turn a blind eye to any sin in us. I don't know if you guys got that. Are you guys got that? Okay, we're back to it. Acts 
At one point, God winked at man's ignorance to sin, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. God wants us to repent of our sin issue. If you sin every day, you better repent every day. If you think you didn't sin, you need to repent every day. <laughs> every day, Lord, guide my mind. Every day, God, take thoughts from me. Every day, God, I don't want to think that way. I don't want to talk that way. Lord, I repent for being me. I just want to be right with you, God. Every day. Isaiah 59 and 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Isaiah 1 and 5, or is that 115? 1 5. 115. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Active sin in our life will bring about devastating results. The sins you let alive and grow in your life will bring about devastating results. And I know some may not see it right now. Some may be toying with it. You may be flirting with it. You may think no one else knows about it. It's under the cover of darkness. It's on my screen. I can, I can erase my history and no one will know about it. I, I, I'm, I'm in this with my, by myself. Listen, Jesus always knows about it. And the sin that you're in right now, it is going to have a devastating result in your life. Do not be deceived. The Word of God is already written down. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. You can't get around that. You can't bring a hot coal into your bosom and not be burned. I promise you, if you're flirting around with sin, it's going to take you further than you want to go and keep you longer. I wish someone would believe that sin's going to kill you. Sin's going to tear you apart. Sin is going to ruin your life. Not only will sin bring devastating results, but it will affect our relationship with others around us. My sin in my life will hurt my children and my wife. But not only does it hurt the people in your life, it puts into jeopardy our salvation for eternity. That really ought to shake us. There's not a whole lot of shaking anymore in the church. It's kind of whatever, it's a good sermon, whatever, it's just nice. Pick and choose. It's scary to think that if I chose to let sin dominate my life, when I need God, he will not hear my prayers. That scares me to think about that. If man lets you down, it's sad. When men forsake you, it's a shame. But if God separates himself from you, It is a devastating, horrific moment in a man or woman's life. But the truth is, and the sad part about that is, so many people don't even know when that happens. They assume because they have experienced moments with God that they are okay with God. They assume I can live however I want during the week. But if I get some chill bumps up and down my spine on a Saturday or a Sunday, I get a tear and the sermon touched my heart and I lifted up my hands and I gave God a praise. and Oh, I felt the presence of God. They assume because they feel something in their heart or in their life, they assume they're right with God and they are not right with God. Please do not confuse God's grace with God's approval. The reason you feel something, the reason you feel anything after a long week of living like a hellion is because that's the grace of God one more time saying, I'm going to let you feel me one more time. If you just come after me, I promise. If you turn to me, I'll turn back to you. That's God's grace. That's not God's approval. That's God loving you one more time. 
don't think he approved of what you did all week long. Because you feel him on a Sunday. That's his grace saying, I'm one more time to let you feel this. One more time before I turn myself away from you. They feel because they feel something from the Lord. That they can live any way they want to and still have God's protection. This was the failure, of course, of Samson. We know Samson's story. You've been a, you've been a Sunday morning experience. You've been part of a Sunday school club. By, by the way, I didn't say it tonight. But if you are not, have no place to be from tw- 10 to 11 every Sunday morning, come join our Sunday morning experience, the commercial, and you will meet other people and we'll connect and grow and love people together. Isn't that a good commercial? I mean, I, anyone want to be there next Sunday? I want to be there next Sunday. <clears throat> this is the failure of Samson. The problem for Samson is this. The stage was set for him to be successful. The problem was his mother and his father lived a sanctified life. And because they made an oath with God that she would not drink anything, she would stay away from things while she was carrying the child, this was her uh, agreement with God that she would sanctify herself, they would sanctify themselves a couple to deliver this promised child. The problem was when he's born, he becomes a teenager. He doesn't want to live the way his mother and father lived. He was a maverick. No one could tell him no. No one could tell him where to go. He had it in his mind. I want to live this way. I don't care what mom and dad are doing. This is how I want to live my life. And the Spirit of God did move on him. And he did have experience of God over the course of his life. But there was a stopping point. There is a stopping point with God. It is not forever going to happen. He's, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall. You may think, I've been doing this a long time. God keeps good books, folks. He knows where you're at. He's he's better than Santa Claus. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows all these things. He knows about your lifestyle. There was a stopping point. Samson's fast-moving, non-God-fearing life caught up with him. And when he finally cut his hair off, God was no longer with him at that point. And he did not even know it. Because he hadn't really felt the presence of God in a real way in so long, he didn't know what the difference was. He said, I'm going to shake myself, and I'm going to go out like at other times before, and knew not that God was not with. What a scary place to be. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to dance and shout and get excited and don't even know God's not even with you. Because you've done it so long without him that you don't even know what it feels like to really have him with you when you're worshiping him. He was living so long on his parents' consecration. And he never developed any of his own consecrations with God. Hey, Samson, what's with your long hair, bro? Bruh? Bruh, what's with your long hair, man? Oh, you know, it's a thing my mom and dad kind of started when I was a kid. You know, no big deal. Just kind of. Say, come on, man, you have a drink. Sam, what's a big deal? I don't drink. Why? Why don't you drink? You know, my church, it's it's about, you know, not drinking and kind of weird thing, you know, they got going on. So I just kind of. At some point, one, you have to realize there is a blessing in consecration. There is a spiritual empowerment for anyone willing to live in a consecration where God says, listen, if you set yourself apart from those people, I will do something that will amaze them. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be like everybody else in my school. I want to be set aside that God, when God does something in my life, everyone else says, I don't know how he does it. I don't know where he gets the power from, but I want what he's got. Because there's power in consecration. Not just because of mom and dad, but because I want to be consecrated to the Lord. I want to see God do things in me that he didn't even do in my grandfather or his father. He was living on his parents' consecration. This is the primary reason why we lose so many people at the prime age of their life to the world. Because they never developed a love for Jesus for themselves. Outside of their parents telling them, you should love Jesus more. Come on, don't talk like that. You, should, you shouldn't talk that way. 
Jesus, people don't talk that way. You shouldn't watch that because that's... And it never becomes something they want to do for themselves because they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. In his whole life, we only hear Samson pray about twice to God. One was a time that he complained about being so thirsty he was going to die. God hollowed out the water and the jawbone. He drank from it. But the last time we hear him pray was just before he kills himself in the temple of the Philistines. His whole life. Two prayers that we hear of during his lifetime. In his last prayer, he prays, oh God, strengthen me this one more time. Strengthen me one more time. This is the prayer you'd think you'd pray, oh God. I know you can give me my sight back if you would. If you do, Lord, I'll serve you the rest of my days. I realize how foolish I was, Lord. Give me strength to serve you this last few moments, whatever it is, Lord, as long as I have to, God, give me the strength. He didn't even pray to to have a relationship with God. He said, Lord, give me strength one more time that I can give a final blow to the enemy in vengeance for my two eyes. (laughs) Do you understand? He's praying because he's so angry that the enemy took out his eyes, he's saying, Lord, just give me the strength to avenge my enemies of my two eyes. He never got the concept of what prayer was about. He didn't even know, had he prayed a prayer to God years ago, God could have doubled the length of time he was judging Israel. And who knows the legacy he would have left behind had he simply had a relationship with God in the very beginning. God moved on him mightily. But God also had expectations for him. He wanted him to have a separated lifestyle from the rest of the world. Please let us not think that God will move mightily for us without expecting something from us. And he still expects a holy people. His command in 2021 is still as real as the day that it was written in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, speaking to the church. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Okay? Yes. Is she, was she here in the church? Okay, let's all stand. We're going to pray for Felicity. She's passed out. She's not reviving from her being passed out. Let's pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, God, you see the situation right now. You see the, the, the extreme, dire prayer that we put out before you right now. Lord Jesus, you can do anything, Lord. There's nothing too great for our God. I pray right now your hand would touch her life, God. I pray right now your hand would be on her today. Lord God, restore health in her bones. Touch her body right now. Open up her airways. Whatever it is, God, right now, revive her. God, this is a holy church with holy people praying to you right now in Jesus' name. Do your work right now. Do your will in Jesus' name. Touch her from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. I cast out sickness right now. I cast out death right now. Lord God, be our strength and be our hope and be our our strength and our encouragement right now. God, I pray right now you touch her, Lord. Revive her, Lord. We believe it right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the healer, that by your stripes we are healed. You were wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Touch her right now. We pray it, God, and believe you for it right now in Jesus' name. We expect it and believe it right now in your wonderful name we pray right now in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name, I believe for a healing right now. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. 2 Corinthians 6.17. You don't just take that page and rip it out of the Word of God. 
Wherefore, come out from among them, he's speaking to the church, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That word receiving, I will receive you, means I'll be, I will be, you'll be acceptable in my sight. I will accept you as my own. I will receive you in glory. I will let you come into my kingdom. Okay? But that statement of being received of God is contingent on what we choose to do. Okay? God will not receive us till we separate ourselves from those who live contrary to God. I can't go along with people that are contrary to God and live like them and talk like them and act like them and still expect to receive the same reward that separated people get from God. We cannot act like those that are contrary to God. We can't look like them or walk beside them and think it won't affect us because it will. Now there's some that have gone out among from us and there's some that may still be with us that still want to live worldly. See, someone that wants to live worldly says you're judgmental because they're not ready to give up the worldliness yet. Now someone that, that, that's ready to give up worldliness and you're thankful for the salvation of Jesus, you're glad God pulled you out of that. While someone could be sitting down the pew from you and they're wanting to get back into that, and the only thing they can say is, well, you're judgmental. That's how they cope with it. That's how they cope with it. Them that still want to live worldly in the church and not holy have turned the word separation into a bad word. They would say that, this is their argument, if we live separate, we are judgmental on those that are sinners. That if we're separate and we live separate lifestyles, then we're acting holier than thou because we're separate. And if we're separate from the world, how can we win the world, right? If we're in our own little box and we're on our own little thing, and how can I possibly win someone that's lost if I myself am separated from them? And then I must ask the question, if the church becomes like the world, what are we winning them to? If you ask your questions to me, certainly I can ask my questions to you. Listen, the only thing that saved the prodigal son was that his father lived at the same address when he came back. Thank God the father didn't give it all up and pack it all in and move to California somewhere. Change his address, change his. The son knew, hey, if I'm going to find myself again a second chance, I'm going to go back to the same house that I left. Why? Because at least in that house my father had rules. And I realized without rules I become a terrible mess and I find myself in a pig pen. Praise God, dad still lived the same house. You talk, you talk about this revival of backsliders that are coming to the church. They don't want to come back to watered down religion. They don't want to go. They came out of that garbage. They want the same holiness church that they left 20 years ago. They want the same preaching, the same believing, the same power that they left. That's the only thing a backslider is looking for. They've had a taste of compromise. They want the real thing. So you keep holding on to that. You keep, I don't care how many people want to leave, how many people want to go their own way. They, they, when people come back, they want genuine, real, powerful moves of God's spirit. And that still raises or not. Listen, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, Moses threw his, his, uh, his staff down. They threw their staff down. He did this. They did it for, for a certain amount of time. There's so much that the, the, the compromising church can do just like us. There's so much. That, there's so far they can go. But I'm telling you, when God really starts moving and he starts pouring out miracles, signs, and wonders, they're going to fall, fall far short of what the true church can do. I'm telling you, God has reserved power and authority for the Jesus name holiness church. Separation 
between holy and unholy has always been the expectation uh, has always been the ex- uh, expect- expectation of God and his people holy and unholy has always been what he's expected of his people this is why when Israel that had lost their identity in Egypt had to have 10 commandments because they had forgotten how to live for God they had forgotten how to have a holiness customs and lifestyles Because they were in Egypt for so long, they had forgotten their distinction between what they were before they went in and what they were over the past 400 years. Therefore, God had to pull them out of Him for Himself and give them a list of commandments. Why? Because when they went to the wilderness and they finally settled in their land, they were going to be surrounded by people that had no commandments. Therefore, to separate his people from all the other godless people around was the Ten Commandments that they followed. The other nations had no rules, but God expected more from his people. He was going to give them rules to live by. I remember years ago, when they had the big thing, when the, I was still working at the barbershop, they had the big thing when the Ten Commandments were taken out of the Alabama courthouse. Do you remember that? That was probably, oh man, 18 years ago. Uh, big, big thing. And, and one of the barbers watching this on, the, on this TV, whatever, said, that's good. I think there should be a separation of church and state. I think they should take down the Ten Commandments. I said, okay, that's fine. I said, then you tell me. What rules we should live by. You know what his response was? I think every man should live by his own conscience. That's scary because a lot of people think that way. Do you know what kind of mess we've got into because of that? That is the same attitude that has dominated so many churches. That say, I want to do, I still want Jesus, but I want to live by my own conscience. I want to live by what motivates me. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what's pleasing the flesh. Why? I don't want commandments. I don't want rules. I don't want holiness. I don't want uh, gates and fences. I want to live however I want to live, but I still want the blessings of Jesus on the weekends. It's a sham. It's a lie. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that in the last days, perilous times would come. People would have a form of God. Are we there? Are we there? People would have a form of godliness. Oh, man, we're just, it makes me sick. It makes me sick trying to stir up what we should be doing really. I, it's like, is, 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 this like I, is this like Twilight Zone? I mean, literally, if you ever watch their, their, their concerts, you got people just doing this the whole time. Oh, it's like a show. It drives me crazy. It's like they're, they're doing everything and it looks, but they're denying the power. They have no separation. And so they're losing what God wants to give them because they're serving him on their terms. So I can have a big old man bun. How would you like that, folks? Out comes your pastor's man bun behind him. Woo-hoo. <laughs> I guess my wife would love that. Now, many churches have pastors that have man buns. Now, I, I promise you, I'm, there's nobody in my mind right now. That's, but the Bible says, doth not nature itself teach you? If a man has long hair, it's a shame unto him. But if a woman has long hair, praise God for women that have long hair. For for a woman to have long hair, it's a covering under her as a sign of submission to her husband who's under submission to God. I praise God for holiness. I praise God for beautiful holiness women. You don't hear it enough. You're beautiful. You're exactly what God has in mind. You don't have to change your hair color. You don't have to change what you are. God made you beautiful. The holiness of God, the modesty of spirit, is much more beautiful than gold and silver and diamonds. So, if I'm a pastor with a man bun running, 
can you let me be your pastor when I, when I completely negate and don't read what the Bible says? If I'm attracted to men, and I like men as a man, can you truly let me be a pastor of a church and try to teach you how to live for God when I myself have totally ripped out Romans chapter 1? And so because of the delusion mind, because they would not love God, he turned them over to reprobate minds, doing that which is seemingly not good for them, man to man and woman to woman. How can we serve under people like that? I'm telling you, folks, it's the world we're living in. They don't care about righteousness and holiness. And I'm telling you one thing. If we ever give up what we have, we're going to be right there with them. I say, hey, let's hold on. Let's hold on. Let's hold on. Let's. I don't care how many people are here. I say, let's just hold on until God comes back. Come on, folks. I don't want to compromise what we've been given. It's too rich. It's too good. It's too precious for us to negotiate away what God has given us. Let's all stand to our feet. I'm sorry I went off on a tangent with that man bun thing. I didn't get to finish my notes. But it's true. It's true. We have taken out so many things in the Word of God and still think that we can be close to God and live any way we want to just because He loves us so much. The woman with adultery, He never called her an adulteress. He never said, I can't believe you do those things. Might, of course, we know where was the man, right? Takes two in that situation. Not one time did he say, you know what, let me think about whether or not we should be forgiven. He looked at the uh, hypocrites and said, you without sin among you cast the first stone at her. They by their conscience, praise God, they had a conscience at that moment. They didn't drop the stones. And he said, woman, well, where are thy accusers? None, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and keep doing what you're doing. I love you so much. No, at that point she met Jesus. And he did not let them stone her. That was grace and love. But I promise you, he only had three and a half years to do his ministry. If she would have went back to that and they would have caught her again, he may not have been around to help her on that one. She had one moment to be right with God. He said, go and sin no more. That, folks, is grace. But that's also an expectation of a Savior. That once you meet me, you'll never be the same again. I'm giving you this moment of grace. Go and live a new life. Do, you, do we not believe that the Bible says they that are in Christ are a new creature? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Why? Why, oh why, are we trying to live like we used to live before we ever met the grace of Jesus Christ? That we can go back as a dog to its vomit? That the proverb says, going back to sin, that the dog has returned again. That, that's the grossest thing I could ever see or think of. But to God, going back and becoming what you were before he found you is just as disgusting to God as a dog going back to its vomit. Because he, he loves us so much that he went to the cross and he already proved that. We don't have to hash that out again. We don't, have to, we don't have to talk about it. We already know that. But now let's talk about what he wants from us today. He still wants a separate people. He still wants a holy people. When he looks in the world, he doesn't want to have to drag through all that junk to find someone that used to represent what he was looking for. But when he looks down on the earth, I want him to see a beaming, beautiful, white robe bride that hath made herself ready. You know what that means? It wasn't an accident that they were saved. It wasn't an accident that they stayed holy. It wasn't an accident they were separated. They made themselves ready. 
But any moment they could have just let down what they believe, take it all off, and just look like everybody else. And Jesus would have missed them because he did not recognize them. When he came to get his bride, I would be so scared and so afraid of being, that is my lifestyle, that Jesus doesn't recognize me when he came to save his bride. Amen. These altars are open. We're going to pray a little while. and just, Let's just love God tonight. Let's just let's thank him for his goodness and his mercy to us. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. If you, he that sins, sin no more. If you steal, steal no more. Any life you're living, don't do it anymore. Seek after the face of God. Love Jesus. Love righteousness. Love holiness. If there's any sin in your life, let God take care of it for you. I want to be like you, Jesus. Come on, he's still looking for a separate church. Oh, I want to be more like holiness, you, Jesus. Holiness, holiness.